Guys and girls, today we're looking at the worst ever games on the Amstrad CPC and we're finally nailing down a definitive top 10. Now this is something I've been working on, believe it or not, for nearly 10 years. I first started gauging opinion on the CPC wiki forums back in September of 2011, which rumbled on for over 12 pages of discussion. It was initially interesting to see such a wide variety of opinion, not just on there, but on various Facebook groups too. Quite often someone would say, ESWAT is terrible, but then someone in reply would say, I kind of like that. And admittedly, ESWAT is kind of a bit of a guilty pleasure for me too. So what also became clear is that how much you paid for it and when it was released made a difference. For example, most of us have fond nostalgic memories of those early Amsoft games, despite them being generally mm, a bit crap. But coders were only just learning about the machine back in 1984. So is it fair to judge a game made in 1984 against one in 1992? I mean, by the early 90s, surely you can't use that excuse anymore. And also, is it fair to judge a game sold for 99p against something that was over a tenner? Also, what if the game is a prestigious and important license? Surely more care and attention would and should be paid there. So there has been much heated debate over the years and we've also done a few live streams on my Amstreams trying to nail these down but also to see if we've missed any by taking suggestions from the live chat. From all that I compiled a list of about 20 to 30 games. Then I put them in a spreadsheet and marked each of the games on various categories to determine the fairest way of getting a definitive top 10 and to save too much argument in the comments. So the judging categories I used are Year of Release, Prestige, How Unplayable the Game Is, Lack of Effort, How Painful is the Gameplay Experience, Price, How Terrible are the Graphics, and Does it have awful sound and or music or indeed none at all, and lastly, How Quickly Would You Switch It Off? And I think that covers all the various factors in what makes up a terrible game. Some categories score higher than others depending on their importance. So like year of release has only three possible points to score compared to how unplayable it is, which could score up to five points. The overall worst game will of course be the one with the highest accumulated points. And if anyone wants my spreadsheet, I suppose I can upload it somewhere and link it. Anyway, enough waffling, let's get it on with our game in 10th place. Our first game in 10th position actually starts off kinda well. When the game is loaded, we're treated to an absolutely kicking tune from Matt Furness, which in fact has ended up becoming one of my favourite pieces of music ever on the Amstrad. So he does a lot of heavy lifting here to take your mind off the awfulness of the game we're going to see shortly. We're also treated to an excellent intro with some very nice animation of our fighters training with their introductions. Finally, we have a decent character selection screen, but it all goes downhill from there extremely fast as we enter a match. So please welcome, quite possibly, the worst sprites ever seen on the Amstrad. Or indeed the ZX Spectrum, as this is quite clearly a specky port just to rub salt into the wounds, and it's no better on Sir Clive's rubber keyed wonder either. So we have terrible, laggy, and unresponsive controls. I mean, we're talking about sometimes it taking over one second to respond, and sometimes nothing happens at all. That's uh, not good for a 1v1 fighter that requires quick reactions. Then there's the appalling collision detection, with hits occurring from punches that missed by a mile away. Uh, but the most bizarre and standout thing in this game, besides the sprites, 
is the sprite and background scaling they decided to do. I mean, why? <laughs> why do we need to zoom in and out of the action? This clearly is the main thing that is slowing the whole game down, and I have no idea why the coders decided to progress on with this in. Uh, keep the screen and the sprite static, and boom, we might have a slightly more playable fighting game. But how on earth was something like the poor old Amstrad going to handle this? Surely it would be obvious before even starting work on the game. We've not seen this before, and we've not seen it since. Even with the uh, also admittedly terrible SNES version, they didn't even bother with that. Nor did the Commodore 64 version, and it's much better for it. In fact, it was hardly noticeable in the arcade original version anyway, so it's just absolutely mind-boggling. The problem is that this is a terrible conversion of an already bad arcade coin-op game. The only thing Pit Fighter had going for it in the arcades were the revolutionary at the time digitised graphics. I think it was the first game to film real actors and their moves and then digitise them into a playable game. Apart from the seedy murky atmosphere the game has, the um, digitised sprites was really its only standout feature. And here we have the Amstrad version with quite possibly the worst possible job they could make of the only standout feature. Not that we're going to get digitised graphics on the Amstrad of course, but come on lads, couldn't we have done a little bit better here? <laughs> Admittedly though, I have a confession to make. I have a sort of strange liking and compulsion to play through the game when I boot it up. I don't know why, maybe it's just the sheer comical what the actual hell is going on here that compels me to carry on. But anyway, I must be objective here, it's a terrible, terrible game. Remove the P from the name and replace it with the letters S and H. And there you go. Oh, Amsoft. It was inevitable that one of your games would make this list. And perhaps this one, Grand Prix Driver with its terrible box art there, uh, and not to be confused with the excellent 3D Grand Prix, may be a surprise to a lot of you watching, and one you've not heard of. Indeed, this didn't appear on any of my lists for years, until recently, when we did an A to Z of Amsoft Games uh, Amstream, and my jaw hit the floor at just how bad this is. Even by Amsoft standards, this is Liquid Toilet. One of the few games from Britannia Software that Amsoft released, one of them you may have uh, expected to find on this list being uh, Home Runner. But this game makes Home Runner look like Manic Miner in comparison. In what could be barely described as a driving game, all you do is move left and right trying to avoid the cars you're overtaking. They either come from the right or left, and all you need to do is pass 30 cars and the game is complete. That's it! You can increase or decrease your speed. Uh, note that they don't use the word brake, instead decelerate, because the deceleration is pathetic and seemingly makes no difference in slowing the oncoming car down if you've moved too late. And your car moves so slowly across the road too, so a crash and death is near impossible to avoid, unless you drive at the speed of a granny driving a knackered old Skoda. It is staggering to think that they charged £8.95 for this back in 1984. Now, adjusted for inflation, that's about 30 quid in today's money. I mean, even the box art is terrible, and I have nothing much else to say here, except that I've seen better racing games as type-ins in magazines. Well now, those of you that follow me will know that I have extensively covered this game both on Twitch streams and on a recent long playing review video on this channel. Uh, I was incredibly intrigued by this game and just how bizarre it was and I thought there must be more to this. So where do we start for those that haven't seen this? Well. Let's just take it from the beginning on this one, as it has to be seen to be believed. First we get this bizarre loading screen that appears to be an interpretation of someone working an Etch-a-Sketch whilst having a seizure. Next we have this thrilling intro sequence, 
as we get to witness the laughable animation of the main sprite walking into a house. Finally, we start the game. And uh, try not to wet yourself with laughter at the rest of these animation and sprites. The laughter though will soon subside as you walk into a room and get immediately killed by a giant fruit. This will happen a lot. The story of you trying to get to a banquet makes no sense nor does the box art because there are no knights with lightning shooting out of their hands to be found in the game and the game is just difficult to get running in the first place and only works on CPC 464s too only. Now aside from the laughable sprites and graphics that can't even be described as basic. The game feels extremely unfinished with some rooms actually bugged which will soft lock you in the game and kill you. My guess and gut feeling here is that this game was made by some kid at school still doing their GCSEs who showed perhaps a demo to Central Solutions, a fledgling company like many of us trying to break into the budget market that Mastertronic had created. And they just turned around and bought the game off the kid as it was and bunged it out. Poor kid. To be fair to it, this was a £1.99 game and I found it strangely compelling wanting to see what other bizarre surprises the game had on offer. Spoiler alert though, there wasn't much, but I did map it out and play it all the way to the end. And no, you're not missing much. But surprise surprise, there is an ending of sorts. And no, this is nothing to do with the god awful Scylla Black TV show that was being aired around that time in the 80s. Although, I think I'd rather spend time locked in a room with that horrible old hag, if she was still alive, than play this game ever again. Ha <laughs> ha, death kick, bless it. Quite a reputation in the Amsha community this game has. So for those of you that know of Death Kick already, you may be shocked to see this only in 7th place. And you must be terrified of what rated worse than this. Now starting from the laughable box art after we boot it up, we can see it's clearly a game made in basic. By a demented baboon at a keyboard. This is like a Bruce Lee movie if it was filmed in stop motion animation and then live streamed at one frame a second over a 56k modem. And it's a bad sign that you can't control it with a joystick and that you need to have the manual on hand at all times just to refer to the instructions for the moves you can make. In fact, I had to make my own reference sheet for ease just to get through the bloody game. Because in each room, there's a baddie that can only be defeated by one of those specific moves. The game then becomes a trial and error fest, just trying to figure out what key press to make. Some enemies though, like the little dragons, are impossible to get past without losing a life, because they just continuously spawn and you can't run past them or move any further. Just adding to the annoyance factor. The graphics are somehow worse than pit fighters. The sound effects and music are pitiful. Just check out this tune on the title screen. Yikes. And of course the game is full of bugs and it often crashes. That is before you reach screaming for the off switch. As for the coder, well, I've never found him credited for any other game. Perhaps they changed their name, moved to a different country, had plastic surgery, who knows? Just so they can never be linked to this trash ever again. And last but not least, this game has the distinction for being one of the few computer games ever that literally brought on an ocular migraine in me. Thanks, Death Kick. Thank you. Into the bin with you. Come on then, be honest, own up lads, which of you testosterone driven teenage boys were drawn in by the box art and the name here of LA SWAT and thought, hmm, this will be a fun and violent shoot 'em up? Well, the latter is actually correct in the way, but the former, well, you would have more fun uh, ripping your toenails off. And uh, you would have most certainly regretted parting with your hard earned pocket money on this. Calling this amateur, would be an insult to budding amateur coders. 
even at budget prices here, there is no excuse. LA Chart is hilariously broken in so many ways, I don't know where to start. Hmm, well, let's start with the core mechanic, well, which is basically shooting things. It barely works. Bullets you shoot appear as two tiny black pixels so quickly you won't notice them. And then you have no idea where you're shooting. And it seems to be at odd angles when you're shooting in directions like up and left or up and right. So often they also just appear to sail through enemies. So that's the next thing that's broken. The collision detection is terrible. Um, and there's no sound effects or music whatsoever. It's all deathly silent. And the uh, sprite movement is laughably pathetic, although I will say the death animations are at least a little bit amusing. Shooting a fog results in their head blowing up to stupid sizes and proportions and then exploding. And if they catch you, then they beat you to death with a club to a bloody pulp and mess all over the floor. Yeah. Um, and you can also shoot the little old grannies too, walking at the side of the road. Hey. Um, apparently though, this is a conversion of an Atari 8-bit game that was relatively playable. This, however, is trash of the highest order. And to quote a member of our community, Anna's favourite catchphrase, this is utter arse candle. Oh and yes, this game often crashes as well. <laughs> what a pile of rubbish. The Amstrad has a long line of terrible, terrible footy games. Fiverside Soccer, Am Soccer, and more, plus a few with famous footballers' names attached to them, like Kenny Dalgleish Soccer Match and Glen Hoddle Soccer. Any of them could have made this list, but one stands out more than any other as the crowning dog turd on the football pitch of Broken Dreams, and it's attached to one of the biggest soccer stars of the era. Mr. Paul Gazza Gascoigne lent his name to this god-awful mess from Empire. And even those crappy budget soccer games like Five Aside were at least playable to some extent. This, though, is a completely broken, unplayable catastrophe. Ignoring the annoying viewpoint change as you move up towards a goal, the worst of this are the players who lurch and jump around the pitch. It almost feels like they are disappearing and reappearing. The ball, when kicked, seems to phase in and out of reality. Goalkeepers are laughably pathetic. The rest of the players shamble about all over the place like escaped lunatics from a mental hospital. Pressing fire is supposed to change which player you control, but often it takes about three seconds at least before the computer decides to do anything. That's anything at all, whether it's kicking a ball, moving a player, taking a throw in, whatever. Even more laughable is when a computer player gets in control of the ball. Often it will stand there like a statue, figuring out what to do next for at least a few seconds and then promptly boot it out for a throw in. I honestly thought when I bought this game with my pocket money back in 1989 that the copy I had was bugged or broken. So enraged and disappointed I was that this has the distinction of being the only ever Amstrad game I ever took back to the shop I bought it from and demanded my money back. And boy, do I own some stinkers I was stuck with. And you know what? The guys at the shop, they did it without any quibble. I think even the shop owners knew how appalling this was. How Empire deemed this fit to release at full price in 1989 when the great Emlyn Hughes International Soccer was out is just mind boggling. I'd rather play Glen Hoddle soccer. And so, Gaza, poor Gaza, gets relegated to the Sunday Pub League. For anyone that bought Amstrad games during its commercial heyday in the 80s, I don't think there's been a game that has disappointed and hurt more than Outrun. Imagine the excitement opening this on Christmas Day and seeing that lovely cover art. It's your favourite game from the arcade in your hands. One of the biggest coin-up licenses by far of the time. In fact, it was, probably was the biggest. And, well, you load it up and you get a really nice loading picture and a decent rendition of that famous splash wave music. You think you're in for a treat. You're all excited and, well, the title screen sets off a few alarm bells. Hmm. Oh, well, you think. Maybe they ran out of time for that and spent it making an awesome game. 
And then it starts. And it's nothing like the loading screen. In fact, you're not even sure you've started. You're pressing up on the joystick and nothing much is happening. And then you realise as the car slowly lurches down the road, it has started. And this is it. No countdown, no fanfare, no music. Apart from the fairly decent Ferrari sprite, what are those graphics? And as you finally get near to your top speed and start moving the car around the road, you realise this is terrible. Absolutely shockingly terrible. There's no sense of speed. The sprite scaling is terrible. The lines on the road turn into a garbled mess of pixels. The physics are laughable. And this was the game you dreamed of owning on the Amstrad. Christmas is ruined. Sure, there are technically worse driving and racing games on the Amstrad, like, well, we saw Grand Prix Driver already earlier on this list. Although, there's not many others. But Outrun is such a huge and important license. Imagine all the tears and crushing disappointment back on Christmas Day 1987. Which is why it is so high on this list. And there are some frankly weird people out there that defend this game, saying it's vaguely somewhat playable, and they may have a point, but as I said, the reason it's so high on this list is the disappointment factor on such a huge, big license. I mean, you would have thought that US Bloody Gold would have assembled their very best team to work on this. Instead, they farmed it out to the normally reliable Pro, who then subcontracted it out to a small Glaswegian team that shortly after became ICE Software, one of my most hated developers, who somehow inexplicably after Outrun managed to get their dirty paws onto a large number of other racing game licenses, which were all crap, reusing the same game engine but only with minor improvements. All of them could have appeared on this list. The sequel, Turbo Outrun, again the mind boggles why US Gold chose ICE Software again. Then there's Cisco Heat, Hydra and others. Those games were only spared from this list due to ICE employing a very talented graphics artist in Alan Greer after Outrun. But even Turbo Outrun, with its much nicer graphics and music in game making a difference, it was the same old crap. So screw ICE software, and I think they're deserving of their own video at some point. Hmm. And especially screw US Gold, who more than likely imposed a ridiculous deadline to hit the Christmas market, the lazy, money-grabbing shysters. Shame on US Gold. Oh, Bridget. <laughs> The biggest in-joke of the Amstra community. Every time I do a request night live stream, I get in the chat, play Bridget, over and over every sodding time. And well, the list was likely going to have more than one Amsoft game. And whilst some might argue there could be technically worst Amsoft games out there, I hear strong shouts for crap like 3D Invaders and others. There's no denying that Bridget is the creme de la creme of crap. Warning signs are there from the title screen that looks like it's been knocked up in basic using the default system font and even the default colours for said font and background. Then it asks you to enter the number of lives, which seems like an odd thing. Then the game starts. It's one sodding screen. That's it. Four controls to lower bridges is your lot. As bizarre mutants in lime green tracksuits appear from what looks like the town hall and march forever onwards to the horrendous discordant sounds of a Colonel Bogey and Jingle Bells mashup. Very discordant, without a care for falling into the lake below and drowning as you have to time the lowering of each of the four bridges so they survive to the building at the bottom right of the screen. And that's it. Repeat, repeat ad infinitum. There's no ending, at least not until you lose all of your lives or you switch off the computer through sheer boredom. Most of you who bought their Amstrad CPC 464s new in the mid-80s were lumbered with this pile of tosh as one of the packing titles. But you have to feel for the poor sods who paid £8.95 for this in 1984 in one of the shops. That is nearly £30 in today's money if you use the inflation calculator. For a game that's clearly written in BASIC, the vast majority of type-ins in magazines were better games.
and you thought you might have heard the last of US gold on this list. Well, you were wrong. This is probably the most infamous game on the list after Outrun, which of course was also, sadly, US Gold, and again, another big license, this time in the first ever official World Cup game. And again, it was abysmal on all formats. US Gold tried to fool everyone by reskinning an already terrible footy game released by Arctic Computing two years previous. When I say reskin, only the menus have changed on the Amstrad version. The game itself is identical and nothing has been tweaked. You can still push and hold right on the joystick from kickoff and score every time. Even in 1984, this game was rubbish. The AI is laughably pathetic and it's an amateurish mess right from the start. So what went wrong here? How did this game come to be? Well, when US Gold started, they desperately needed funding, and Ocean Software founders David Ward and John Woods provided that, but for a whopping 50% share of the company, which US Gold founder Jeff Brown very soon regretted. But at least he had a large talent pool at Ocean to call up on whenever he needed a new product, or at least so he thought. And so Jeff asked the boys at Ocean to come up with a footy game for their recently acquired World Cup license, which was agreed upon, and Jeff went back to churning out crap products on the US Gold. As the deadline grew closer, that being the start of the actual World Cup, with weeks to go, Jeff decided to check in at Ocean on the footy game. To his horror, he discovered that Ocean had simply forgotten about it and had nothing. In a panic, he scrambled around trying to find something, anything, knowing that if they had to make a game from scratch, it would nowhere near meet that important deadline of getting there before the World Cup started. So instead, Jeff found this obscure game from Arctic Computing, hoping no one would notice. But they did. The marketing team came up with an idea to stuff the box full of posters, badges, flyers, flags and other nonsense and they tried to sell it as a kind of multimedia package rather than a computer game. No one was having any of it and when it was released with the public, shops and distributors angrily returning the game in their droves, the magazines savaged it. I'm not sure US Gold ever recovered their reputation, but it didn't seem to matter because they still continued shifting tons of licensed games by the bucket load. They did at least lose the license for the World Cup in 1990, and in this game, well, uh, they tried to add something, which was a laughably pathetic practice mode, which consisted of taking, then saving penalties, and a ball control mode. The penalty mode was a rip-off of the same joystick waggling event from Ocean's Daily Thompson's Super Test, so they were still ripping things off here. And the ball control mode is just a crap, keepy-uppy thing. None of these you will ever get to use or do in the main game. Amstrad Action Magazine famously gave this 0% in their issue 11 review and noted they were not sent a review copy until after the World Cup had finished. Hmm, funny that. US Gold, what a bunch of There could only be one winner, and most of you could have guessed it by now. Ah yes, the infamous Count Ducula 2 from Alternative Software. A game so bad that even Amsoft would have laughed it out of Brentwood House back in 1984. The only good thing is the loading screen and the title screen music, but this does not in any way redeem it. Let's be clear on that. So, as we start the game, we can tell right away this is a specy port, cheaply and quickly converted over from the ZX Spectrum. But just stare in disbelief at the awfulness of the graphics. This is 1992, people. 1992. We are eight years on from the days of Bridget and surprise, surprise. And just look at those platforms. Instead of them moving up and down the screen like, you know, platform games from as early as 1984 did, they instead randomly disappear and reappear, and then laugh in disbelief at the animation or lack thereof. For example, the mighty no frames of animation on poor Count Ducula's jump. There are Tiger Electronic LCD games that are better than this, 
and more responsive too. Push something on the joystick and maybe a second or two later if you're lucky, Duckler might respond. And just to add salt into an already gaping wound, the asteroid shoot 'em up section from the Spectrum and C64 versions is completely missing here. But that is not the worst of it. Oh no sorry. This game is completely broken and impossible to complete. Let's just start with the first screen and the jack-in-the-box near the end of it. Clearly you're meant to jump over it when it's not springing up. But from wherever you jump from, you always end up landing on it or walking into it and losing one of your 20 lives. Now 20 lives might seem overly generous initially, but then you realise why. It is impossible to get past this jack-in-the-box without losing a life. Seemingly, when you jump, you can't jump past the top of the plane area. Mm. So let's move on to screen two. Now here, you start top left. And think, you can jump onto the platform appearing to your right. Except no, you jump and immediately fall to your doom. There is no possible way to jump from where you start to a platform. There is also no platform that appears directly below you to fall onto. So, that's it. That's where you die. And you cannot jump past the top of the level and go through the top of the screen. I even went and checked the Spectrum version just to be sure. And yes, you can on that. And that's how you get through the level. Quite unbelievably, this means they cannot have play tested this. What's happened here is, I'm guessing, when porting from the specy version, they didn't take into account the different screen sizes. It's not possible they actually coded in a height limit after porting, deliberately making the game broken. I mean, I don't know. How no one noticed this beggars belief. There is, however, one way to legitimately get through this screen, and that is to use your special move and call on the character Tremendous Terence by pushing down and fire on the joystick and he will appear and carry you across the screen. The trouble is you can only do this once until you get to screen 14 where you meet up with Igor the butler who will give Duckula a broccoli sandwich that will allow you to call on Terence one more time. However the problem is screen 7 is broken and impossible to pass without Terence just like screen 2 so you are basically stuck here because you've already called on Terence and you cannot progress any further. Believe me, I've tried with various methods, reloading from snapshots hundreds of times, trying to find a way to glitch through the level, but you can't. That's it, game over. And that's all the game you are getting. That is unless you poke and cheat with like unlimited Terrences, for example. But it's, again, utter arse candle of the highest order. And it is telling that alternative software never sent the main Amstrad magazine at the time, and the only remaining one, Amstrad Action, a review copy. They went and bought one anyway, and gave it their second lowest score in their history, of 3% in their December 1992 issue 87. It is utterly gobsmacking how anything this broken, glitchy and unfinished could ever be released by a renowned company in 1992 it just blows my mind and there you have it count duckley 2 is the worst ever amstrad game so before we finish I would lastly like to give some dishonorable mentions to the following games that just missed out on the top 10 First up, we have 3D Invaders from Ansoft, a confusing, slow and boring mess of a game. Secondly, another game from Ansoft, Roland on the Run, also by the same guy who did Bridget and holds the distinction of being the worst Roland game and that is saying something. Next, Super Space Invaders from Domark. How a company in the 1990s could screw up Space Invaders, one of the earliest and most famous computer games and simplest games, is beyond me. Next, we have Line of Fire from US Gold. Oh, US Gold. A game so laggy and unplayable, I'm actually angry it didn't get into the top 10. Next, we have Double Dragon Free from Storm, which is a specy port that is so slow, but worse, 
they forgot to take that into account and increase the timer on the levels. So the timer will run out before you even finish a level on average. Next, ah, another one from Amsoft, Home Runner. And I'm still mystified that they included a rolling demo of this game on the official Amstrad CPC 464 welcome cassette. Okay, next up we've got Altered Beast from Activision, which has a lower frame rate than hard driving. Um, the coin up wasn't much in the first place, so we weren't expecting much here, but Jesus, look at this frame rate. Next, we have Super Grand from Tinesoft. Wow, quite a lot of Tinesoft games could have appeared here too, but this was by far the worst. And lastly, Cassette 50, a compilation of some of the worst typing games possible. Well, for 50 games on the tape, you can't moan too much about it, but it's still legendarily awful. And check out the Amstream livestream I did of all the games. So there you go. That was our top 10 after years of extensive research, canvassing, testing, and going to daft lengths with spreadsheets and all that, scoring them. What did you think? What are your worst games on the Amstrad? Did I miss any? Let me know in the comments below. And thank you, and goodbye. So thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please click a like below, leave a comment, and also subscribe if you haven't already. And over that way, there's another video for you to check out. Zypho, out.